All right, so I know in the lab, <clears throat> uh, Jack talked a lot about details, you know, about how the ECG works and the traces and the, um, uh, you know, cardiac conduction system. Um, start off with knowing what's happening in the cardiac cycle and then try to relate that to what's happening electrically in the heart and what that means for the electrical activity we can pick up on the ECG, right? Okay, so what does each of those waves on the ECG mean? What is it telling you of what's happening in the cardiac induction system? And what part of the cardiac cycle is going to be initiated by what's happening in that part of the cardiac induction system? That's where you want to really start. Slightly uh, past that is going to be figuring out this whole deflection whether it's a positive or negative deflection. And think about where the electrodes are and the details of what we were talking about with which, how the um, depolarization and repolarization happens in different areas of the heart. Now, I posted a helpful uh, video on that up on Blackboard. And I think it's actually really useful, and I uh, strongly encourage people to take a look at that. All right? Um, and so, uh, I want you guys to be able to at least understand the ECG trace, the cardiac conduction system, and the cardiac cycle, how they're all connected. That's really a major goal. And then uh, once you guys have mastered that, take a look at how you figure out the deflections, you know, uh, the specific depolarization, repolarization of the certain areas of the heart, because that is influencing what's happening with the deflections on the ECG trace, right? Okay. And so this is what we're talking about. And remember, just like when we talked about um, muscle, skeletal muscle tissue, that muscle tissue contracts after the electrical stimulus. Okay, so same thing in the heart, only we just don't have nervous tissue intervening in the heart to stimulate it to contract. It does it, has its own autorhythmicity. You know, there are certain pacemaker cells in the heart that are stimulating the uh, contractile units, the cardiomyocytes, to contract. All right? And so I just wanted to be clear about that, uh, you know, because I think. Uh, uh, Jack told you a lot of details, you know, and that, you know, uh, you know, you can get lost really quickly there. Um, and so I want you guys, though, to start out, build a solid foundation, and then build up from there. And if you guys have any questions on that, please let me know. All right? Okay. So we talked a little bit about these guys. And we talked about structures of blood vessels and the venous return and comparing arteries and veins. And like I said, what I want to do is talk about the capillaries, which are the smallest vessels. And, uh, you know, so just like reg regular blood vessels, <clears throat> they're made up of tissues. That uh, first layer that's making up the border of the lumen, right? For all blood vessels, you know, what is that? Think back to histology. It's that first type of tissue that's basically making up the border. It has an apical and a basal surface. That's one type. Yeah, epithelial, right? And specifically, it's a particular type of epithelium in the, that makes up blood vessels and we call it the endothelium. And here with uh, capillaries, there's several types, we're not gonna go into the different types, but they can be more porous, allowing more contact of the surrounding tissue with, say, uh, the blood tissue, right? For instance, uh, you know, most of the blood vessels we have don't allow blood cells to exit, but there are certain structures in our body where we want to get rid of cells that are too old, right? So think back to uh, that discussion homework we had last week. So how were platelets removed? 
or what structure did that? The spleen, right? And so the spleen's one of those areas where, you know, there's blood vessels going in there, capillaries that they're a little bit uh, holier, they're leakier, allowing some of those swarmed elements to be removed that are kind of old, right? Liver's another one, okay? Um, so, you know, there's different types of endothelium, right? So we have a simple squamous epithelium in there. And generally what ends up happening is we have our higher oxygenated blood, and generally it can flow through a main, uh, main region in here, through here. But there's also ability to cut off this capillary bed, you know, with small sphincters so that blood passes by or it doesn't get shunted towards some of these, you know, uh, capillary beds. And so that could be one way to regulate blood flow to particular tissue or type uh, areas of tissue, right, is to control how much blood gets shunted using these small sphincters. That's what this is kind of showing here. Right? Okay, so here we have the arterial end, right? So that's where we have the higher oxygenated blood, and then we have the venous end or the venial end over here. Okay, now what stuff are we bringing towards tissues? What are some of the important substances that blood's bringing towards tissues? Oxygen, absolutely. So other nutrients too, okay? So for instance, possibly glucose, right? What are some things that are being taken away from tissues? Waste products. So think about metabolism. So once again, carbon dioxide's a big one, right? So other waste metabolites too, so um, also are gonna be taken up. So where's that happening? Where's the delivery? end of this arterial side right and then kind of the take up or moving the waste is going to be on the yeah the venous or the venial side okay so how does this happen that's the kind of the next question right there's two major forces involved so think about the heart it's pushing blood right just like if you're pushing a uh, you know, a plunger on a syringe, right? You have pressure being forced on that liquid. Everybody with me on that? So that's called the hydrostatic pressure, okay? Right, so hydrostatic pressure. Now, the other type of force we have involved is going to be the osmotic pressure or gradient, okay? So here, we're talking about, all right, well, if I have a high concentration of proteins on one side of the membrane, a low concentration of proteins on the other side of the membrane, okay, which way is water going to flow? It's gonna go towards a area of higher solute, right? Okay, higher solute. So there's an osmotic gradient as well, right? And so there's osmotic pressure. So here, uh, colloid is generally referring to the protein. All right. So we have the osmotic pressure, and then we have the hydrostatic pressure. One of the ways to think about this is the hydrostatic pressure is kind of the pushing right, of substances out of the blood, or pushing of things into or out of a compartment. And the osmotic pressure is somewhat more of a pulling action. So you kind of have this, you know, battle going on as to which is the dominant force. So which way things are going to flow is going to be dependent upon adding up the summation of those two forces, right? So what's the net result of adding up those two forces? So here on the arterial side, if you look at you know, the net filtration pressure, there's more hydrostatic pressure than there is osmotic pressure. So pushing out versus pulling in, right? There's more pushing out than pulling in, which means nutrients are going to be 
net moving out of the capillary, the arterial bed. Everybody with me on that? So as things move, right, along a uh, capillary bed, say, you know, we call this our arterial, um, you know, we go towards the venial end, okay? So here we're going to see that now our pushing out of blood is much lower than the pulling in of substances, right? So here the hydrostatic pressure is less than the osmotic pressure. So which way is the net movement of molecules, in this case, substances? So it's going to be going now into the blood, right? So it's this battle between pushing things out via hydrostatic pressure or pulling things in via the osmotic pressure, exactly, okay? Everybody with me on this, right? That's the biggest thing. It's a lot of kind of, I think, uh, uh, ways to confusing, confuse students when they take a look at this, but it's just those two pulling and pushing forces that you add together to figure out which is the dominant force. Okay, yeah, Sean. Yeah, and so what's doing the pulling? It's the solute concentration, right? So let me give you guys a situation. Say someone has hyperglycemia. What is hyperglycemia? High blood sugar, right? So they got hyperglycemia, high blood sugar. What's that going to do to the system? Which of these forces increases? Osmotic pressure, right? So why does that one increase? Exactly. Right. So what you know, if you take a look at this, right, more solids in the blood, are you getting as much of a force out at the arterial end? Probably not. The other thing is if you increase solute concentration, right? We know water goes to higher solute concentration, right? So if we increase that solute concentration, what's that doing to the amount of water being taken up from tissues here? What do you think? Is it going up or down? Well, where do we have a higher solute concentration? Where do we increase it if we have hyperglycemia? In the blood. So if that went up, what's happening to the water movement from surrounding tissues? Is it's going to go towards a higher solute concentration. So it's just like if we start off with you know, certain solute concentration, we add more solute into it, right? And that's going to pull more solution towards it, in this case, water. So what's that going to do to the volume? Increase blood volume, right? What's that going to do to blood pressure? Increase, right? What's that going to do to the urine output, do you think? So we increase the pressure in the renal system, in the kidney, and therefore we get more filtration. And so one of the reasons that diabetics who have poor control of their blood sugars, right, they have cardiovascular related issues, but they also have elevated urine output. So it's one of the hallmarks there of diabetes. Okay. So understanding how these two forces interact with each other helps with understanding what's going to happen with movement of substances. Everybody with me on this? Any questions on movement across a capillary bed? Does it make sense to folks? All right. So if we decrease cardiac output, which one of these are we affecting primarily? So which hydrostatic, right? So if that goes down, what's happening to that net filtration at the, so it'll be going down, right? Because the hydrostatic's pushing, it's that pushing force, right? So you're doing less pushing, which means you're more likely not going to get as much filtration movement at the arterial. Yeah. Everybody following me on that? Okay. And those are the types of games you want to play, right? Because there's going to be issues out there where you run into this with some patient, uh, client, and so forth. Everybody with me on that? Any questions before we move on?
Okay. So we talked a little bit about this, the blood pressure and the cardiac output and peripheral resistance. We reviewed that with the quiz, right? It's a combination of those two. And remember the cardiac output is really, we're talking about what the heart, the main pump is doing versus peripheral resistance, which is what those blood vessels are doing, right? And we talked about peripheral resistance where <clears throat> if we double the radius, we reduce the resistance by 1 16th. So resistance is inversely proportional to the radius to the fourth power. So small changes in diameter of peripheral blood vessels have dramatic changes on peripheral resistance. So not surprisingly, we're gonna see there's a major effort by our homeostatic mechanisms to control blood pressure. One of the ways is by controlling blood vessels. So they're kind of like smart blood vessels, right? They can control their diameter. <clears throat> All right, so we talked a little bit about this cardiac output, basically how fast the heart is beating and how much volume is being pumped out per beat. And specifically, we're interested in systemic, uh, you know, blood pressure. So we're really interested in the cardiac output coming from the left or right side. What do you guys think? Which one's pu pushing, yeah, to the left, right? And so here at rest, the cardiac output, you know, we have heart rate times stroke volume, then we have vigorous. We can elevate or decrease that depending upon the demand being placed on it, right? So we can increase, uh, you know, cardiac output. Maximal cardiac output for really uh, athletes is gonna be really high. The difference between a resting and maximal cardiac output as the cardiac reserve. All right, does that make sense? Cardiac output, any questions on that? All right, so here, this is something that, you know, I just briefly wrote, wrote on the board. We did a little bit of, um, you know, kind of some mental games to take a look at what happens if we affect something, right? So here we have cardiac output, which is a combination of heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume is going to be end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. And so here, there's factors that can change this. There's three major factors. You're gonna run into these if you go and work in a clinic, all right? And you're working in the healthcare field. One is called preload, second is contractility, third is afterload, all right? Preload is going to be the uh, you know, muscle stretch before contraction. So what we're talking about is venous return. So if we increase venous return, then we're increasing preload, okay? So here, if we, con if we suddenly increase the amount of blood being pumped into or returning to the right atrium, for instance, right? That's gonna increase the amount of blood found in the right ventricle, that's gonna increase the stretching there of that right ventricle and it's gonna to contract to more to try to offset that increase in venous return, okay? So that's preload. That's the return blood to the heart. That's what we're talking about. If we change that, we're talking about changing preload, right? Before uh, the blood gets injected from the heart. The other one, I'm gonna circle back to contractility, is afterload. This is basically the uh, blood pressure that the, or the uh, force that the heart has to overcome to eject blood, okay? So let's think about peripheral resistance. Let's say that we have blood vessel uh, arterioles that are have a pretty large diameter, okay? And then we suddenly decrease that diameter. Right, okay, and let, let's, you know, let's say that we can decrease that diameter by having things accumulate, to start narrowing, you know, the amount of space the blood can flow through, all right? So some sort of disease, wink, wink, okay? All right, some sort of disease. Now, is that increasing the force or decreasing the force 
that the heart has to overcome to eject blood into the systemic cir circuit. Increasing it, right? So we could say that's an increase in afterload, right? So how do muscles respond if you increase demand on them? They work harder, so you guys spend more time in the gym. What ends up happening to muscle mass? Gets bigger. So not surprisingly, what do you see with cardiac muscle tissue? Gets thicker, it gets bigger. Absolutely, right? Okay, so that's what we're talking about afterload. Everybody kind of clear what's the difference between preload and afterload? Preload's a little bit more has to do with the venous system, the blood returning into the heart. Afterload is kind of that force that the heart has to overcome to eject blood. So a little bit more of the systemic system, right? Contractility is for every, you know, uh, contraction, all right? Do we increase or decrease the force of that contraction? Right? So the sympathetic nervous system, one of the things it does is it helps open calcium channels so that you get more cross bridging. Right? So here if you think about muscle tissue, the more cross bridging that goes on, the more forceful the sliding filaments can pa move past each other. Right? And if they move past each other more efficiently, then is that increasing or decreasing contraction strength? You got a 50-50 chance. So they're sliding past each other more efficiently. So it means that, you know, are they contracting more forcefully, you think? Yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah, because we have increased calcium, which means you get more cross bridging. They're going to be able to contract more strongly, right? So for every you know contraction, if it's contracting more strongly, we're ejecting more blood. So this was that whole, whole inotropy that we are talking about, right? So here, inotropic agents they affect contractility. It means that you know for certain stretch, right? we've affected the strength that that muscle can contract. So if you have the same stretch without a uh, positive inotropic agent, okay, then with an inotropic agent, we get a stronger contraction. The same, you know, resting length of those muscle fibers. Okay. All right, everybody clear on that? These three terms are the major impact, right, that people talk about when they talk about effects on the heart. It's preload, afterload, and contractility. All right. So here, not surprisingly, if we increase venous return, this is increasing preload, right? Right? Increasing blood volume, we're increasing preload. Okay? And so here, that could increase the end diastolic volume, which increases stroke volume, and everything else remains the same. That means cardiac output should go up, right? Right. right. So here, if we increase contraction strength, right, does it make sense that end systolic volume goes down? So remember, end systolic volume is how much blood remains in that ventricle after contraction. If we're contracting more forcefully, that means that we're ejecting more blood. Therefore, end systolic volume goes down. Right. So ha one of the ways we can change that venous return is by affecting that milking action by skeletal muscle pumps. So if you go back to that slide where we talked about all the factors that aid venous return, one of the major ones is that skeletal muscle pump. Right? Okay. Let me just finish up here with looking at the receptor reflex, okay? Um, you guys have seen this in the lab. I'm just going to go through it a little bit. There are receptors, okay, where if we have an increased blood pressure or decreased blood pressure, it's detected by baroreceptors, okay? Right, baro, so what type of meter reads the pressure uh, atmospheric pressure, barometer, right? Not surprisingly, we have baroreceptors that are really stretch receptors. They, de 
they detect the changes in pressure by how much the blood vessel stretches. Stretch their, so their mechanoreceptors. So what ends up happening is they send a stimulus to an area that is important, the brain stem, specifically the medulla oblongata, right, to offset this increased blood pressure. So if we want to offset increased blood pressure, should we increase or decrease heart rate? Decrease heart rate. So that's one of the things. Now think about cardiac, uh, sorry, blood pressure is a combination of cardiac output and peripheral resistance. So what do we want to do to peripheral resistance? Should we increase it or decrease it? Decrease it. How would we do that? Think about diameter of blood vessels. Increase the diameter of blood vessels, right? So we're going to decrease peripheral resistance by vasodilation, right? So dilating the blood vessels, making them larger. Right? Does that make sense to folks? You do both of these things and you have a dramatic effect on blood pressure. All right. So here, what about decreasing blood pressure? Right? Baroreceptors, once again, are going to be able to pick this up and send that to the uh, area of the medulla oblongata and the brainstem that's going to integrate that information. And it's going to send effects out. So here we have areas that are going to be affecting heart rate, cardio accelerator, and cardio, cardio inhibitory centers. Right? So here, if we take a look at these, right, we decrease blood pressure. We want to try to elevate it. So we're going to elevate heart rate. And what do you think about peripheral resistance? Should go up or down? Should go up, right? And that means what's we what are we doing with the diameter? Contracting, right? So vasoconstriction in this case. Does that make sense to folks? Right? So these these whole reflexes that we talk about, if you understand this whole idea of cardiac output and peripheral resistance that we've been talking about since last week, this should make sense. This should fall right into all of the things that we talked about. All right? Okay, so let's take a break. So let's take a five-minute break, and then after the break, we'll take a look at the discussion for, uh, you know, the homework there. All right? Uh, feel free to visit with your neighbors about the answers you got, you know, during the break. All right, so why don't we come together as a large group? And so uh, for those that didn't see the announcement, you guys can turn these in in person after we have our discussion, uh, you know, now. Or you can turn them in via Blackboard by the end of the day, right? Um, yeah, and if you, can, you, if you want, you can stop by my office and turn them in person, too, if you can't navigate how to uh, turn them in via Blackboard. It's perfectly fine. Uh, all right, so let's start off with task one. <coughs> And the first thing we should do, you know, when we're talking about a case study is kind of summarize what's going on with the patient. So who wants to quickly do that? Who wants to give the lowdown on Ron here? So, so what's going on? Okay, good, good. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, um, talking about what, how the patient's presenting, what are the symptoms, that's a great place to give a summary. Right, you know, when are you, you know, talking about a patient, you know, if you're handing off between shifts in the healthcare industry, you got to bring the new people up to speed on that patient really quickly, right? And so, is there anything else? He's on beta blockers, important, right? So you want to make sure that people coming on board know that there are some medications that the individual's on, okay? Um, ta -ta -tum. All right, yeah. All right, cool. Important too. Awesome. All right. Uh, anything in particular, you know, happened to him? Okay, good. We'll talk about that. You know, anything else? He, he's still alive. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, let's start off with some of the questions. So what made Ron's veins bulge and his feet swell? So what happened there? So what's causing that? So Ray was saying poor return. So talking about venous return. Yep, 
absolutely. And what you're saying there, Sean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all those factors, so if you guys you guys look back at that, you know, Venus, all those factors that aid Venus return, you know, um, there's a few that you probably are going to be uh, more interested in based upon what you're seeing here with Ron, right? But overall, you know, what happens with having poor Venus return is that more of that Venus flood is going to be dwelling where? Yeah, so in places where, you know, it's uh, going to basically, um, uh, you know, accumulate. So, veins, you know, of the feet in the lower legs, right? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on that one? Anybody have anything else? Yeah. All right. Uh, what could have accounted for Ron's ooh, dizziness upon standing? All right, so what do we call that, you know? Uh, when you stand up quickly, you guys took a look at this in lab. Right. So syncope is fainting, losing consciousness there, right? Right. And so what type of hypotension? Orthostatic hypotension, right? Because here you're going up really quickly and it takes a second for that to be normalized, right? So here you stand up real quickly, Ron's dizziness, what's happening to blood pressure? Is it going up or down? Going down, right? How is going how is decreasing blood pressure lead to dizziness? Yeah, so basically that low blood pressure, we're doing less perfusion of the brain, right? And that's really what's leading to dizziness. Anybody have anything else there? That's pretty much it. All right. Okay, so see, this was uh, probably took a little bit of digging on your part, okay? So Ron's on beta blockers. Uh, so how do beta blockers work? So let's start off there. We talk about those. Yeah, yeah. Are they positive? Is is it uh, stimulating the beta receptor? Is that a positive or a negative chronotropic effect? Stimulating them. So we're just not talking about the blockers. We're just saying stimulating that receptor. Is that a positive or a negative? Positive, right? So here, okay, you put a blocker on there. Would we call that an antagonist or an agonist? Antagonist, okay. And so that is going to be decreasing the positive chronotropic effect, right? So it's not necessarily stimulating the heart rate to slow down, right? It's just limiting the ability of it to speed up. Everybody following me on that? Okay. So it's kind of like putting a governor on the gas pedal. For those that you know uh, are familiar with that. Okay. Right. Okay. And so uh, ARBs. So I didn't write out what they were, did I? Oh yeah, I did. Angiotensin II receptor blockers, ARBs. So how do they work? So what does angiotensin II receptor, what does angiotensin II do? What are the things it does? Okay, vasodilation, right? Okay, so it means that those blood vessels are going to be dilating, so the diameter is getting bigger, right? Okay. Anything else that visa the ARBs do? Can we find anything else there? So they do. So angiotensin two, right? So angiotensin two is going to be restricting or vasoconstricting. So if you block it, you get vasodilation, like you guys said, All right? What's something else angiotensin II does? Can we find anything else that has effects on blood vessels, that's for sure. Right. 
Can we find anything else with angiotensin two? Well, certainly it does. You know, one of the ways it can do that is through the change in the blood vessel diameter, right? But there's another thing that it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did anybody figure out any effect on any hormones? So it actually is going to. So angiotensin II increases aldosterone release, which increases blood volume. So if you block that, right, you decrease blood volume increase, right? So both beta blockers and ARBs are working to try to do what to blood pressure? Lower blood pressure. Doing it in different ways, though, right? So one is having mainly an effect on heart rate. The other one is affecting, so peripheral resistance, right, and also blood volume, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Angiotensin two, the molecule that stimulates a receptor, normally restricts. Right? So what you're doing is you're blocking that ability to vasoconstrict, which means that you're decreasing peripheral resistance with the ARB. Yeah, and it's an important point when we're talking about whether uh, we're, whether we're talking about the actual antagonist or we're talking about what goes on normally at that receptor. So we've got to be specific and use our words carefully here. Right? Yes. Normally, angiotensin II gets released to try to maintain or elevate blood pressure. But if you put an antagonist or a blocker in there, right, you're going to decrease the ability to increase blood pressure. So you're going to try to block someone's already high blood pressure from getting further increased, right? Everybody with me on that? Okay. So when we're talking about the blockers, the drug, or the when that norm receptors normally stimulate two separate issues. We've got to be careful with how we do our discussion, right? So why do you think changing medications would be beneficial? Yeah. So aldosterone? Mm -hmm. So why might it be beneficial there? Yeah, and you know, there's probably multiple answers here. As long as you can talk through it kind of like what Keenan just did, you get, you know, full credit. I'm perfectly fine. As long as you just provide some, you know, logical analysis and reason behind it. And basically what he's saying is that going to ARBs, you kind of take a load off the heart, right? You're maintaining blood volume. Now, if you maintain blood volume, how do you think that's going to help with venous return? Right, so, right, yeah, so, you know, that may end up being beneficial there with maintaining blood volume to help with venous return in some cases, right? Because one of the problems Ron's having is what? So what did we talk about there in A? Yeah, yeah, so we're, it seems to have some issues with the venous return, and hopefully ARBs might help with that, as where with a beta blocker, all you're affecting is the chronotropy of the heart. Right? Okay. And so that's kind of what we're getting at. There's probably other answers out there where our students in the past have come up with, and I'm perfectly fine with those. But is that making sense? So here the ARBs are affecting more of the periphery, the blood vessels, and the blood volume, as where the beta blocker is affecting the heart rate. Right? Everybody with me on that? Okay.
All right, what caused the thump in Ron's chest when he dove into cold, ice cold water? What's that? Palpitation? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, you know, let's talk about, first of all, you have what in blood vessels? What, right? So what if you quickly just decrease the diameter of a lot of your blood vessels all at once, really fast? That, what's going to happen to the blood peripheral resistance? Goes through the roof. What's happened to the blood pressure? What's happened to afterload, specifically? Afterload just goes straight through the roof, right? And what is afterload? It's really the force the heart has to overcome in order to eject blood. So now the force that it has to overcome to eject blood is so much greater, right? So think about what's going to happen, right? The thump in the heart, uh, you know, the chest, because it's happening at the heart level, right? When that heart tries to push that blood through, and now it's got a huge resistance to do so, does that pressure on all of those structures increase? Absolutely. Right? So when that next heartbeat count comes, right, do you think it's going to be a lot louder? Yeah, absolutely. So that thump in the heart, you know, there's a few different ways you can think about it. One is that, you know, there's a huge constriction and increase in peripheral resistance, which is kind of putting a lot of pressure on those great blood vessels and the heart structures, right? So when the heart tries to contract, there's a huge pressure on all those valves and the surrounding tissue. Think about the tendinous cords that try to maintain the AV valves. So one of the thoughts is that the part of the heartbeat is the quick tensing of those tendinous cords. So if you pull a cord even quicker with more strength, is that louder? Yeah. So there's a lot of things going on, but you guys nailed it, right? You know, that you're increasing this kind of afterload, the kind of the pressure that heart has to overcome. All right. Awesome. All right. Mitral valve prolapse. What's that? Ooh, how, why is that bad? Right? So think about it's one way direction. Right? So here, that AV valve, do you want it flapping back up into the atrium? Because if it does so, when the ventricle contracts, right, instead of, say, the left ventricle pushing blood through the aorta, where's that blood now? Where can it go? Back into the, you know, left atrium. That's a that's bad issue, right? That's bad news, right? One of the things that help prevent that is the cordonous coordinate tendine, right? Helps with providing further support to make sure those valves don't prolapse. You know, they don't bend back in a wrong direction. All right, everybody with me on that? Okay, so let's talk about myocardial ischemia. So what was that? Mm hmm absolutely. And so we're talking about myocardium, right? So we're talking about, you know, why would it be dangerous for someone of, with those conditions to dive into ice cold water? So with the myocardial ischemia, you basically got you got some major blockage in the heart, but that's mm -hmm. the blockage going on in the belly. So when you have that giant vascular constriction and you still have mm -hmm. that cold water, um, right. completely improves your your heart. Right, yeah, so you're decreasing perfusion of the actual heart tissue. Plus, if he has a mitral valve prolapse, is he pumping as efficiently out of the left ventricle? Probably not. Right, and where, you know, the we didn't talk about it, but branching off of those coronary arteries to perfuse the heart tissue so it gets its nutrients comes off of the aorta. So if that blood, not as much blood's going to the aorta, then what are we talking about with perfusing the heart? There's less, less perfusion, right? Okay. All right. So I think what we'll do is, unless you guys have any questions on task two, you know, 
uh, what I'll do is, uh, you know, we'll leave it there, and then we can pick up with task two on um, on Wednesday. Uh, you know, if people want to. Okay. You still need to turn in though the discussion homework for task one and two today though. Okay. All right. Awesome job, you guys.